are here with Andrew Waters tonight. I'm Jackie with Hub City Bookshop, and I'm just going to give everybody a few minutes to um, get online and get settled. If everyone could make sure that you're muted um, so that we don't interrupt Andrew while he's talking, that would be great. All right, I, I don't have anyone else waiting to come in. We have 12 online, which is awesome. All right, I, again, I'm Jackie with Hub City Bookshop, and I'm here with author Andrew Waters tonight. We are so happy to have him. Um, and I'm just going to give a little bit of a run through of how um, we were talking about this going before I give an introduction for Andrew. So if you will please um, keep your microphones muted, and if you have any questions, just um, type them into the chat window, and I will voice them for the author. He has a presentation for us tonight, so I'm going to let him um, go through his presentation without any interruptions, and then I'll, ha I'll be happy to take questions after that. Um, he is looking forward to questions from the audience, so please feel free to ask um, anything that you'd like, and I'm sure he's happy to talk to us about it. Um, we do have signed copies of his book, To the End of the World, at Hub City Bookshop, so um, those of you who ordered a copy through Eventbrite, it will be on the way already. I've sent those out today. Um, so just for a bio for Andrew, um, Andrew Waters is a writer, editor, and conservationist. He is the author of The Quaker and the Gamecock, Nathaniel Green, Thomas Sumter, and The War for the Soul of the South, and editor of Battle of Cowpens, Contemporary and Primary Counts. His writing has appeared in Wake Forest University Magazine, North Carolina Literary Review, and other journals. He has a BA from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and an MBA from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and is pursuing a PhD at Clemson University. He lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina with his family, and we are very happy to have him here tonight. Thank you for coming, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, Jackie. Um, happy to be here. I am gonna try to um, share some images with you tonight, so I'm gonna try to set that up real quick. Um, Perfect. So, let me see. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, so, first I want to thank Hub City Bookshop. Um, that's our hometown bookshop here in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we're just really privileged and, and um, lucky to have such a great bookshop here. Um, they're downtown on West Main Street, but they've also got a really great new online book buying uh, function, so you can just go online and order it through them, but it, it ships out and everything just like you were buying it online. So please patronize Hub City Bookshop. Um, I also want to thank my publisher, West Home Publishing. I'm really proud to be published with them. They do beautiful books, pretty much only about the American Revolution and colonial um, era history. Um, they're up in Philadelphia, and they've also got a great website. So you can either patronize Hub City Bookshop or West Home Publishing um, for your books. Um, so I wanted to start off tonight um, talking a little bit about you know, why I'm, why I wanted to write this book. And, um, I don't really know why, but I've always wanted to be a writer. And the only thing I can really attribute that to is to, um, well, for two things, um, because I love to read and I remember growing up, um, our mother, would take us to the library every week and we'd come home with a big stack of books and we got to spend the whole rest of the week kind of going through the books. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, of course, I loved uh, television as a little boy. I loved watching Daniel Boone on, um, on, on the weekdays when I get home from school. So that whole era of popular culture was very influential on me as well. Um, and then I, I've always enjoyed reading history. Um, I remember playing on the floor in the living room of our house and my, my dad had these big bookshelves um, kind of lining the walls of the living room. And I, I remember being on that floor and looking up at these giant 
history books that he had on these shelves. And I always felt like um, as a kid, that those books had something in them that I needed to know. I wanted to find out what was in those books. And I think um, moving to Spartanburg, um, South Carolina in 2013 was really like opening one of those big history books on my dad's bookshelves because this whole um, region's history of American Revolution really opened up for me when I came here. Um, and one of the things that happened because of that was it, it, it opened up an understanding about Revolutionary War history in other parts of the Carolinas where I had lived. And when I was read, first reading the story of the race to the Dan, well, first, um, if you read like a, a regular history book, um, the race to the Dan and a kind of a typical American Revolution history is this period from November 10th or February 10th to February 14th. And it's really this period um, in during the American Revolution, when Nathaniel Green and the Continental Army was had had been retreating across the Carolinas and they made it to Guilford Courthouse, and Cornwallis was really hot on their tail. He was over here in Winston Salem, and Green was trying to get north up into Virginia because he had a lot of supplies stationed there, um, and he could supply his army if he made it up to Virginia. But the problem was that he, he had to get his army across the Dan River to get to Virginia. And um, Green was trying to catch, uh, excuse me, Cornwallis was trying to catch Green before he got the river to the river. And you can imagine that if that had happened, um, it would have been pre a precarious situation for the Continental Army because the British outnumbered them at that time. Um, they were better trained than the Americans. They had more uh, armaments. It was, the, the Americans were in danger of being annihilated if Cornwallis caught them. So that is kind of the typical period of the race to the Dan that you'd see talked about in, your, in history. Um, but the story for me uh, really had a much broader context. Because for me, the story of the race to the Dan really stretched back to the Battle of Cowpens, which was about a month before. And being here in Spartanburg, that battle is very important to, to this city. There's a statue of Daniel Morgan, who is the American commander of that battle, here in the very middle of town. So by moving to Spartanburg, I've become very aware of that part of the story of the race to the Dan. And then when I was uh, working at the Land Conservancy in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, I worked on this part, this river, the Catawba River. And that river also very, plays a very important role in the story of the race to the Dan. Um, and actually there was a, a battle fought on the Catawba River uh, called Cowan's Ford, which is a um, big part of the book. Um, and then after they crossed the Catawba River, they also crossed across the Yadkin River here at Salisbury. And I had lived in Salisbury for seven years and really was not aware of this um, history that had occurred there. I mean, there's a lot of history that happened in Salisbury and I was aware of a lot of it, but it was just kind of surprising to me um, that I had never heard about that part of the Salisbury history. Um, so that for me is really kind of the reason that I wrote this book. It's because the story of what happened during this period of the American Revolution really, I really connected to it in a, in a very kind of tactile way because in my job in conservation, I'd spent a lot of time walking up and down these rivers and 
you know, I knew these regions of the Carolinas in a way that, um, you know, wasn't exactly the same as Nathaniel Green, but one of the things that interested me about this story was that when Nathaniel Green came down and he had just taken control of the American army at Charlotte in December, but as he was riding down from the Northeast and he had just been given command of the, the Southern Continental Army, which was in total disarray. They had been defeated at Camden. Um, they were really um, just kind of barely hanging together as an organized unit at this point. And, um, but as he came down, he conducted these studies of all of the rivers that he was crossing and that he figured he would encounter as he was commanding in the South. And when I was reading about this history, I was reading about these um, expeditions that Green um, sent to the Catawba River, the Yadkin River, and the Dan River, which was a part of the Roanoke River. And Green wasn't, um, he was trying to figure out how to move supplies up and down um, these rivers as a way of feeding his troops because he had just been, been the quartermaster general of the American army and he was kind of a logistics master and he could, uh, uh, he could really had this uncanny ability to kind of see ahead and figure out just exactly what he needed um, to make things move and to make things happen the way he wanted them to happen. Um, so he knew all along that he would have to understand how these rivers operated if he was going to be operating in this part of the Carolinas. And that idea of his kind of interest in these, these three rivers um, that kind of overlapped with my career and my work in, uh, along these rivers as part of my, my conservation work. Um, that was the intellectual connection to the story that I used um, to write the book, or, or at least to kind of get the idea for the book. Um, hold on, let me go back a little bit. So I thought I would spend a little bit of time with you tonight, and I'm not going to talk too long because I want um, to be able to talk to you and answer some questions. But I wanted to kind of introduce the two main characters of the story to you a little bit. Um, and here they are, Nathaniel Green on the left and Charles Cornwallis on the right. And they're, so even though I had this intellectual kind of river thing going on when I was writing the book that kind of kind of went out the window once I got going into the writing of it and I really started getting interested in these two men and kind of their characters and and you know their backgrounds and what brought them to this point in time in the American Revolution and of course I'd already been very interested in Nathaniel Green I actually my first book was was also about Nathaniel Green, the Quaker and the Gamecock. Um, so I already had this, this huge interest in Nathaniel Green. And I think, and one of the things I tried to do in the book was kind of contrast the two generals. And there's a reason why I think that Nathaniel Green was ultimately successful and Charles Cornwallis was not. Um, so hopefully I'll remember to say that at the end of the presentation. Um, but uh, Green was born in, Rhode I uh, in Warwick, Rhode Island in 1742. His father was kind of that prototypical Yankee merchant. He was actually, um, one of the things I find interesting, he was the second highest taxpayer in Warwick in 1763. So his dad was very industrious, but his father was also a very devout Quaker. And one of the really defining things that happened in Green's life was that his father wouldn't let him get any kind of formal education. Um, his father believed that, he kind of believed that religion was really 
religion and business were really the only two things that you needed to know. And if you knew any more than that, you were just, you know, uh, it was ultimately, it, it wouldn't serve you any better than, than that knowledge that you already had. Um, but Green really resented that. And he tried at several points kind of to educate himself, or he also would, would had a talent for finding good mentors. Um, and it was clear pretty much to everyone who knew him that he was immensely gifted intellectually. And here's a, one of the lines that I like that I put in the book. One of his biographers described him as possessing eyes lambent with combined light, partly from within, partly from without, as of a soul alternately questioning itself and the world that surrounds it. Um, and we know that uh, one of the things that he was very interested in was the enlightenment. Um, this was a really big, um, you know, kind of the height of the enlightenment theory and these enlightenment ideas that um, you didn't have to have status or, or your, your birth didn't really kind of dictate who you were and what kind of mind you had. Um, and that was a very powerful kind of idea to Green as he was growing up. Um, and that also extended into kind of military thinking. So one of the things that was going on at this time were these, these were these European writers, they um, called them Enli the Enlightenment military writers. So there's a guy named Maurice de Saxe, who was a Hungarian, but um, fought with the French army, who wrote this book called The Reveries of War, which supposedly he had written in kind of a, a laudanum um, haze. It was kind of a mysterious book, but the, these type of texts were some of the things that Green would have been exposed to. And this was a very, this was a time when um, young men kind of studied military and really you were expected to participate in the military through the militia. So that was very much kind of an embedded part of your life. Um, so anyway, Green, um, he, he eventually kind of, um, he grew up, he, he eventually he did educate himself, but he stayed loyal to his family. He was, you know, even into his late twenties, he was, um, basically working for his father. Um, but then the build up to the American Revolution happened and Green managed to become the general of what was essentially the Rhode Island militia. And when the Rhode Island militia went to support the American cause at Boston, um, Green was kind of co-opted into the, ver the brand new Continental Army, like a lot of the, the people who were there at that time, or Henry Knox is another famous example of somebody who just happened to be there, and they said, okay, you're a general in the Continental Army. Um, so this was kind of, you know, for somebody who didn't have much, um, really much kind of um, aristocratic status, it was pretty amazing that someone like Green could be named a general in this new, the army of this new country. And he always did very well at it. He was always one of the best American generals, um, but he had some issues. And um, he, Washington had made him quartermaster general um, which was the basically the supply officer for the army, and um, Green didn't like that job, and he didn't like being criticized. It was a very political job, and he the the Congress criticized him for being in charge of for things that he had done as quartermaster general, and he'd written these very um, uh, harsh letters to the Congress to the point where they'd almost gotten rid of him in the army. So Washington had really kind of saved his butt and to save his career had gotten him out of the quartermaster general office and sent him down to become general of the Southern army. So this was his kind of big shot. 
Cornwallis, on the other hand, was kind of aristocratic to the core. He was born in 1738, so he was really only about four years older than Nathaniel Green. Um, but he was um, the eldest son of the first Earl Cornwallis and inherited his father's title in 1762. Um, he had always wanted to be in the mil military and of course through his family he rose quite quickly through the ranks. Um, one of the interesting things I find about Cornwallis is that he was um, considered a very close friend of King George III. I mean as much as King George III had friends, um, Cornwallis was considered one and, and this had led to several very um, um, on, uh, lots of honorary titles that apparently meant quite a bit if you were an, an English aristocrat. Um, but Cornwallis had come to America and he was clearly one of the most, or the most talented British general in the British army in North America, but he had always kind of been a second fiddle himself. And there's a myth that he was the commander of the American army, but he, he never really was the commander. He was just um, always second in command. Um, so when he got sent south to take over the, what had become the Southern British army, it was also kind of his first chance at command. Um, so there were these two men coming from very different places, but they were, had the same job and kind of had some of the same pressures and um, political um, intrigues going on in the background. I mean, I don't want to take too much more time because I want to leave some time for questions, but in the end, I think that Green was much more creative and adaptive than Cornwallis. And that's the reason why I think that he was successful in the race to the Dan. And certainly it was his planning that enabled him to kind of get across these rivers just in the nick of time and, um, and ultimately escape to Virginia and save the Continental Army and, and um, Cornwallis ultimately couldn't adapt to the situations that he had that he encountered here because he was he was more part of a bureaucracy than Green and he was more um, limited to his conventional approaches to warfare. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up with that. I don't want to go on too long. I want to get to the questions and um, Jackie, I'll let you go ahead. All right. Um, would you mind ending the screen share, Andrew? Certainly. There you go. Um, so we, we don't have any questions from the audience so far, but thank you so much for the presentation and giving us a little background. Um, that was really great. I did wonder, since you wrote about Nathaniel Green, you mentioned in your first book and in this book, what about him was so, I guess, intriguing or inspiring to you that, that wanted, made you want to write two books about him? Yeah, um, well, so, if, yeah, it was interesting. I think for one thing, I want to give credit to this book. When I came to South Carolina, I read this book in the, in the uh, I found this book in the Spartanburg Public Library. And I tell people this was probably the most important book I've ever read, certainly in the last 10 years of my life, because really a lot of what I kind of first learned about Nathaniel Green, I learned from that book. Um, and that book is a much broader book than, than either of mine, and it kind of encompasses several different parts of the American Revolution. Um, but I just love that book so much, and he did such a great job kind of talking about um, how Green had conducted himself during that part of the American Revolution. Um, 
So for the first book, The Quaker and the Gamecock, I was kind of adopting that intellect, an intellectual perspective of Green kind of coming to South Carolina and encountering the landscape there and kind of having to adapt to what he found in South Carolina. And that was for me part of my experience coming from North Carolina to South Carolina. It was just kind of encountering the South Carolina culture and learning about it the same way I felt like Nathaniel Green did. Um, for this book, it was really that kind of, that connection to the landscape that he was experiencing in a kind of a way that I felt like- I have to somehow get back to the fact that I'm not driving. I had to be- In a way that I felt was kind of similar to mine in some ways. Um, and I just felt like this was just, a fantastic story that that nobody really knows about. There's been there's been no other book kind of specifically devoted to this topic that's been published. Mine is the first one that's really just just about this part of the American Revolution. Um, and it was I just thought it was such a great story that it was something that I felt like because I'd had this connection to it from a landscape perspective, I felt like I could tell the story in a way that that maybe kind of was unique or that um, nobody else might be able to tell it. Thank you. So you kind of wanted to focus in on that area a little bit more um, and explore it. Yeah, it was really the kind of the overlap of places in the Carolinas that I was familiar with. Um, and certainly one of the things was the connection to what happened in Salisbury. Um, I tell a story in the book that I used to work with a guy named Joe Morris and he told me he would, Joe Morris loved to tell stories. And he told me this story about Nathaniel Green kind of bursting into this tavern in downtown Salisbury on this winter's night. Um, he's all alone. Um, he's, he's hungry. He's cold. Um, the innkeeper is like, you know, trying to help him and she brings him these two bags of gold and says here I'm, or specie money and says here I want you to have these bags of money so it's a really cool story but I always kind of I would look at Joe and say Joe if that story is true how come I've never heard it before how come I've never heard that story from anybody else and you know God damn it, it turned out it, the story was true, that Joe was telling the truth. And um, so it was that kind of awakening about the Salisbury region that was also part of the inspiration for this book. Thank you. Um, speaking of your inspiration, one of our audience members, Emily, wants to know um, if you're, you talked a little bit about your childhood and reading, did your childhood imagination carry over into your writing? She asks, for example, when the canoes on the rivers and the streams in the Carolinas, do you pretend you're one of the, the soldiers to kind of sink yourself into that as you write? <clears throat> yeah, I think for sure. Um, you know, I've always had an interest in writing and for many years, I tried to do fiction writing. I, w I wrote short stories and tried to write some novels. Um, so I do kind of have that, uh, try to put some of that fiction writing or kind of more creative um, perspective into my writing. And especially when I'm doing my revisions, when I'm rewriting, you know, I do think about ways to try to present the information um, that encompass imagery and, and metaphor and just ways to try to make it more interesting um, writing. Um, so I, I think in that way, I wouldn't say that I imagine myself in the, the boats, but I do try to imagine a creative way of expressing the information that I'm trying to convey. Thank you. Um, let's see. There's a couple more questions. Um, one of them was um, from Daryl, and it was kind of, I'm going to ask this one next because it was based on what we were just talking about. If you're on a river crossing our landscape to bring a story to life, what landscape would you pick? Um, 
please set the scene of that landscape and invite us to enter into your story about green. So I guess like, is there a particular image from your conservation work that you think about when you're writing? Um, well, let me see if I can find it in the, in the book real quick. Sure. And another question I can answer for you, um, Catherine asked if you're working on your PhD and I know that you are. So if you wanna talk about that, any you can, but. And I also posted the title of the book that Andrew held up for us, um, The Road to Guilford Courthouse. So to Daryl's point, um, there's several instances that I could, I could think of, but one of my favorite um, is when uh, Green had made it across the, the Yadkin River at the Trading Ford, which is an extremely historical part of the Yadkin River and Rowan County. That is where the, the main highway came down and forded the Yadkin and went, into, went on into Salisbury from that point. And I had done a lot of work, um, or, you know, I, I knew a lot about the trading ford through my conservation work. So that, that area had always interested me. So, the Continental Army had made it across the Yadkin. And one of the things Green knew from his survey was that you, you had two days after a torrential rain to get across the Yadkin before it became uncrossable, before it became unfordable. So it had rained um, really hard, actually, the day that they fought the Battle of Cowan's Ford and Green knew that he had two days to get across the river. So he really pushed and pushed and they made it across the Yadkin River just in the nick of time. The, really the British kind of pulled up just as the last part of the army was, was getting across the Yadkin. And because Green had all the boats on his side, the British couldn't get across and they were furious and they were they pulled up their cannons and they were so mad they just started firing their artillery across the river and it just lasted into the night. And apparently there was a little cabin down right by the Yakin River that um, Green had appropriated as his headquarters. Um, and the British apparently didn't see the cabin because their cannonballs were going over the cabin and Green was sitting in the cabin writing his correspondence. He was a relentless correspondent. He always spent, you know, the, the whole night writing, writing to other people. So the, though the British artillery barrage sent the cabin's clapboards flying from it in all directions, Green wrote on, nor seemed to notice anything but his dispatches. His pen never rested, but when a new visitor arrived, and then the answer was given with calmness and precision, and the pen immediately resumed. I just thought that was a super cool um, moment um, right there at the Yadkin River. I love that. That gives really good insight into Green, too. Um, one of the questions was from Evan. Um, how much of a head start did Green have and what did he do differently than Cornwallis to win the race? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, you know, if I, I mentioned earlier, there, there were these kind of, these ideas about warfare that were kind of part of the intellectual discussion that was going on. And one of the kind of the cool phrases that I talk about in the book is called petite guerre petite guerre, little war. And that was the idea that you could, you could fight war with um, essentially what were called light troops or detachments. And these were, these were troops that could kind of move around. Typically they had horses and soldiers, but they often relied on horses to get places. So they were much more mobile um, than kind of conventional 
troops, troops of the line, regiments of the line is what they were called in the British Army, just, um, you know, just the foot soldiers. So in the South, um, it was really a terrain suited for, for that kind of petite guerre or, or mobile war. And Green understood how to do it because that was the only way the Continental Army could ever fight. They never had the resources to fight a conventional war like the British. Um, but the British Army, um, it was so bureaucratical and everybody kind of had their own job and their own roles and you weren't really supposed to step on anybody else's toes. You know, they could never quite develop that mobility that they really needed to win in the South. Um, and that's one of the reasons that he, he defeated Cornwallis. That was one of the reasons why he was able to escape and then later come back. Um, but then the other reason was because he was a better planner than Cornwallis. He had, Cornwallis had been in the South um, ever since May, the previous May, but the, I've never seen any evidence that he did anything like what Green did as far as sending people up into North Carolina and really trying to learn the topography and the terrain of the areas where he, you know, he knew he was getting ready to march that way, but he never really investigated it. But Green, that was just one like second nature to him. He understood implicitly that he needed to know that information um, to command the army in the region where he was getting ready to go. So for those two reasons. Thank you. Um, another question kind of about, about Green as well as from Sharon. Um, she wants to know what was Green's relationship to South Carolina after the war was over? Well, I do think that's an interesting part of the story and one I really talk about more in this, the first book than in this book. Um, but kind of after the action occurred in this book, Cornwallis goes up into Virginia and is eventually surrounded by Washington at Yorktown, but Green comes back to South Carolina. And really he fights a whole other part of the war after what happens here um, in South Carolina. Um, and that's really the part of, that I talk about in the, the first book, The Quaker and the Gamecock, because he was able to essentially liberate South Carolina from the British, um, but he also, you know, had some, some personality issues as, as we all tend to do. Um, so that's the story of that book. After the war, South Carolina was so grateful to him um, that they awarded him quite a large parcel of land. And it was his plan to kind of become a gentleman farmer um, after the war. And that's one of the things that I'm interested in too about the story of Nathaniel Green. I really think that had he lived, he would have gone on and played a very influential role in the Washington cabinet and would have been much more well known today than he, he was because today he's just kind of known as a general, but I truly believe he would have been in Washington's cabinet because Washington trusted him implicitly um, more than any other general um, that he had. I mean, he was essentially a, a son to Washington. So I, I, I feel pretty confident about that. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> it wasn't long after the war, I think about six years after the war, he was only like 44, um, and he died of heat stroke working on one of his plants, plantations. Um, this one was actually in Georgia, but he died at a very early age. It was kind of cut down in the prime of his life. Um, and that's why we don't really think more about him today, or that's one of the reasons why which I think is an interesting part of his connection to the South. Yeah, and that he might have lived in South Carolina longer afterwards. That's, that's interesting. Um, Catherine wanted to know a little bit more about your PhD work and if it's in history and if you teach history, because I know you also are an editor, so you're, it sounds like you're very busy and have a lot going on. Um, do you teach history or is your PhD in history? 
No, I'm actually working on a, a PhD in a program at Clemson called Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. But my PhD work is, is focused on my um, land conservation background. Um, I really, the history writing is really just a hobby. Um, it's an outside interest. Um, it's a way for me to kind of continue to do uh, my, continue to develop my interest in writing. Um, you know, I've felt like my history writing has been very well received. I actually, I got some exciting news today. There's a website that I submit to and one of my articles has been um, uh, selected to be in a published anthology that this uh, website puts out. So I was excited about that. Um, oh, congratulations. Anyway, I, I just, it's just a way for me to express my writing and um, I enjoy it. I enjoy the topic and um, I've been able to have some success getting published with it. Um, what's the name? Do you mind sharing the name of the website or the upcoming publication? Uh, of course, the Journal of the American Revolution. It's called, it's actually got two names. It's called All Things Liberty, which I think is the um, URL for it. But I always do try to mention them. Um, they were very influential in kind of publishing some of my early work and kind of giving me some confidence to try to do this as a book writer. It's a, it's a neat little website if you're interested in the American Revolution and colonial period. Yeah, I'll um, post that in the chat for you guys in a minute. Um, another question kind of related to your writing was, um, how many hours did you work on this book? Um, or like, how long did it take you to write it and research and everything? Who knows? <laughs> um, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you. It took me um, about a year and a half total. Um, one thing that I think I'm, makes me successful as a writer is I just, I've just developed a habit of getting up and, and writing for a couple of hours every morning. So over time, it just kind of accumulates. Um. I posted that URL in the chat if anyone wants to check out um, some of your other writing and revolutionary Thank thoughts. You. Um, another question from Trey was, can you give your thoughts on the impact or effect of the Battle of Cowan's Ford? I was always struck by the imagery of the resultant burial of General William Lee Davidson by torchlight. Um, yeah, that's another um, part of the the story of the race to the dam, the Battle of Cowan's Ford. Um, and I write about it quite a bit in the, in the book. Um, I'm not familiar with the anecdote about the, the funeral, but I can talk a little bit about William L. Davidson. Um, he was the commander of the militia on the east side of the Catawba River and um, the counties weren't all weren't the same then as they are now but I believe I as I remember he was he was considered the commander of the Rowan County Militia which extended down to what we consider Charlotte today. Um, so once the Continentals made it across the Catawba River um, they Davidson was the militia commander there that they met with and kind of coordinated their strategy with. Um, and Davidson's role was to kind of guard the Catawba when to let the Continental Army, which was then still under command of Morgan, to get away, to get up to Salisbury so they could get across the Yadkin. So Davidson was really left behind at the Catawba River at Cowan's Ford to, to lead the American uh, resistance there. Um, and it was a pretty significant skirmish. I mean, I would consider it a battle, um, but it's probably one of the lesser known battles that occurred in North Carolina and South Carolina. 
Um, the British were marching across the, at the break of dawn. And it, you know, it was, it was the February 1st, I believe. It was the first day of February. It had been miserable weather for weeks. And the British have to get across the Catawba because Green and Morgan are getting away. So they start marching across the river and the Americans are on the other side. And this is just militia at this point. It's not the Continental Army. It's just the, the men that lived in that region. They're shooting down at the British Army as the, ar as the British Army is trying to cross this kind of rain swollen river. Um, so you can imagine the British weren't in a very good mood when they finally made it to the other side. And Davidson was killed in the fighting there. Um, and it, this is the same Davidson that, who is the namesake of Davidson College uh, outside of Charlotte. Um, it, it wasn't established by him, it was established by other members of his family, but it was named in his honor. Um, so Davidson is, you know, I think one of those historical North Carolinians that we don't hear about too much these days, but I was happy to be able to tell part of his story in the book because I find it very interesting as well. Thanks, Andrew. That's great. Thank you, Jay. Um, another question from Daryl is um, who developed as Green's right hand man in this race and was the aftermath of Sumter haunting Green into North Carolina? No, the answer to the second question is no, because things really hadn't gotten too bad between them yet at this point. Um, so no, he wasn't really thinking about Thomas Sumter during this part of the story. Um, but there, you know, one of the things, another part of the book that was so interesting to me were the officers that were in the Continental Army kind of serving under Green. And I always think about that scene from the Dirty Dozen where Lee Marvin's kind of walking down the line and, you know, you're, you're getting introduced to all of the, the Dirty Dozen. And I think any good war story kind of needs that scene in it where you're, um, you're learning who the right hand men are. And I tried to do that in the book, not, not literally, but kind of figuratively, there's a chapter called the Southern Gentleman, which is about all of Green's officers and kind of their backgrounds, which is pretty remarkable um, that these men did so much and, and went on to do so much, but it was just that was just a transformational moment in American history when, when you could do things like that. Um, but to answer your question, I think by far the most interesting right-hand man is light horse Harry Lee, Henry Lee, who was a Virginia officer. And Henry Lee, light horse Harry, we know him today as the father of Robert E. Lee. But he was a very successful American cavalry officer and Green had actually specifically requested Lee when he had been given command of the American South. Um, he, he specifically requested that Lee be a part of the detachment that went with him. And Lee's interesting for, for two reasons. One, he was um, a very talented cavalry officer. He, he, he was kind of in the last part of the book is when he his role really starts to come out and he's really the one kind of keeping the British at bay as the Americans are attempting to get across the Dan River. But Lee also wrote a memoir of the American War and it's actually one of the most important um, historical references for this portion of the American Revolution. And actually for a fair amount of the, the last couple of chapters in the book, Lee's account was really the only one that I was able to use. I really based a lot of the information on Lee because he was the only one that really 
left any kind of written record of this period. Green, of course, never wrote his memoirs because he was he died early. Um, um, but not only is it the only one of the only records that we have, it's also really fun to read. He's a good writer and he he has lots of great lines, many of which I cribbed and put into the book. So I love that. And that's such a neat reference to have as you're as you're writing, I'm sure. Um, we don't have any more questions from the audience at the moment. If you do have any more questions, we just have a few minutes left, so please plug them into the chat. But um, I did want to ask you if you're working on anything else right now, any other books um, that you want to talk about? Well, I am working on another one, but uh, this one seems to be going much slower than the other two did. I, I do want it to be kind of a bigger book, um, okay. a little bit longer. Um, but I'm not really ready to talk about it at this point. But I do, I, you know, I kind of, I got this one and another one, and I'd, I'd like to see three on the bookshelves. I've always kind of imagined it as a trilogy. So yes, I would like to write another one. Does it, um, can you share that it might also have something to do with Nathaniel Green or does it have a completely different center? Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say. Okay, that. okay. I, I don't want to pressure you. I just wanted to see if I, <laughs> how much I could get the audience to look forward to next time. Um, but yeah, we do have, <laughs> um, Puffy said you're leaving us hanging. Um, <laughs> Um, so I am going to show this book one more time, and your signature is right with this beautiful picture painting that you have in here, um, right here. I really love um, the art on this book. Um, the back looks a little bit different from the front, too. Um, did you, was your publishing experience for this book similar to the previous book, or did you have a different um, experience? Yeah, it was completely different. Um, the first publisher is a company called Casemate, and they're actually out of England. They're out of London. So I was working with an editor in London, and, you know, it, it, it was a fine experience, but you know, there was a bit of a cultural disconnect. So they didn't really make me do any editing because they didn't really know much about the story of it. Um, the publisher this time is, is, is called West Home Publishing. I mentioned them earlier. Um, they're really a boutique publisher. They do a very small amount of books, um, but I just think they do beautiful work. Um, it's kind of a one-man operation. I think he um, was, you know, prominent at the University of Illinois, maybe, or, you know, a, a university press. Um, but he just wanted to set up his own thing and do his own thing. And I'm um, just so impressed with the quality of the books that they produce. All of their books are beautiful. If you ever see a West Home book, you'll know it because it looks very nice. Yeah, this one is really beautiful. Um, uh, the, print, the print of it is. Um, we have, I'll take this one more question um, from Stephen. He asks, um, which you think was more decisive, Kings Mountain and Cowpens, or the race to the Dan, or are they inextricably linked? Oh, um, no question. Right? The Kings Mountain was more important to what ultimately happened in the South. Um, they're both, I mean, I love the story of Kings Mountain. I, I'm fascinated by it. They're both great stories. Um, I think, you know, I would just say that for me, one of the things this story i think is is lesser known than the story of king's mountain so that's one of the reasons i wanted to write about this because i i really wanted it it to have its own kind of story its own book that's really special um i think that's that's it for this evening as far as questions um is there anything that you wanted to close with andrew no i'm just so thankful for you all spending this hour with me and um I see um, some many people that I know and um, some that I don't know. So, you know, that's that's gratifying to to know that 
I've got so many friends here and so many people who just were interested enough in the book to, to come listen to me ramble on for an hour. So thank you. Um, and, and please buy the book from Hub City Bookshop, the best bookshop in this world. Um, thanks so much, Andrew. We do have a couple just nice messages that I'd love to read out. Um, uh, Tom says, thanks for another great book. I appreciate how you continually tie your experience to the story. It makes history come to life once again. Excited to continue with this book and you're awesome, Andrew. Um, let's see. Uh, Daryl says, great fireside chat. Sharon says, congrats, Andrew. Anne says it was great and informative. Thanks so much everyone for the nice messages. And thank you again, Andrew, for coming and agreeing to talk with us. Thanks everybody. All right, have a good night everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Bye Andrew.